Welcome back to the complete guide to spin here at the Rock Code Academy. In today's video, we're going to carry on with our SDK walkthroughs, taking a look at the Python SDK. Let's dive in. So in order to get started with the Python SDK for spin, you will have to install the Pi to Wasm plugin. So to get started with the Python SDK for spin, the first thing you need to do is make sure you are on version 0.9 or greater. Once you have that version of spin available, you can run spin plugins update. From there, you can install spin plugins install PyTowasm. And in order to generate a new Python project with the spin CLI, you will also need to add with spin template install the Python SDK. From there, you can generate a new spin project with spin new. And this will give you a directory structure like so. We have a pip file, which has all of the dependencies that we need, which for this example is zero at the moment. We also get an app.py, which defines a handle request function and returns a 200 response. We'll dive into the Python code in just a moment. Lastly, we have the spin.toml. Here we can see the three components that we expect for all spin components. One, the build step, two, the trigger, and three, the ID and the source simple. Now we can test that this works as expected by running spin build. From there, we can run spin up, and this will show us that we have an HTTP server running on localhost 3000. Using curl, we can confirm our endpoint works like so. Perfect. So like the other SDK walkthroughs, what we're going to do is run through some common tasks that are almost ubiquitous when working with the spin SDKs. Our first endpoint, which we've already seen because spin knew generated it all for us we have an endpoint that allows us to print out hello world. However, we'll make a small modification to this and run through the build and run steps one more time. From there, we're going to take a look at how we work and interact with HTTP for spin components. We're going to get the headers, parse the HTTP body, and even parse and understand the query parameters. Lastly, we'll take a look at making outbound HTTP requests with the spin SDK. So let's make that first change to our Python code. What's important to note here is that this is just any regular Python program, like working with any of the spin SDKs. You don't actually need to learn anything new to start building WebAssembly components. So much so, we can add hello world on the CLI. Minus the extra quote. So let's modify our simple generated endpoint to return a JSON payload. First, step one. Make sure we're returning the correct content header or content type header as part of the HTTP response. Next, we're going to import from JSON dumps, assuming I can remember how to type any Python code. Next, we're going to remove this F string and then use our dumps function with a Python dictionary, where we will say that my name is David. And I don't have a Python format uninstalled, so I'll just do it the hard way. <laughs> Next, run spin build, spin up, and we'll run our curl one more time. Only this time I'm feeling rather confident, and we're going to pipe it straight to JQ. And as you can see, we have the print statement running in our spin up here, as well as the JSON output from our HTTP response. So that is our first HTTP endpoint with a simple modification to work with JSON. Nice. So let's talk about request headers. How do we get the headers from the HTTP request being made? And before we dive straight into typing some code, I have a confession to make. Unfortunately, the LSP for Python is not going to help us auto-complete our way to victory in this code. And there's some interesting reasons why. So first, why am I telling you this? Well, Normally what we would do is provide enough typing to our code like so to autocomplete on headers, methods available on headers, on the body, on the status, and so forth. However, as you can see on the screen here, we see unknown for request. And this is because the Python SDK for Fermion Spin is not written in Python. So the traditional Python tooling for LSP just isn't going to work. And that's because the Python SDK for Fermion Spin is written in Rust. 
Now, the team are actively working on getting bindings for LSPs available for the SDK, and hopefully that will be available very, very soon. But for today, your best friend is the code. So if you go to github.com slash fermion slash spin dash python dash SDK, you will find the crates directory, which has the spin python engine directory. Inside of that, you will find source and a single lib.rs. Now you do not need to be able to read Rust to get the help that you need. As you can see here, we have a struct. This is just a type definition, and we can see all of the properties available on the HTTP request. We can see the method, the URI, the headers, and the body. This works for all the types you'll have to interact with as you build your Python SDK Fermion Spin applications. What's important to note here is that the headers are a vector, a vector of tuples, where the tuple is a string string type or a string string tuple. Now, Python supports tuples, it doesn't have vectors, but it has lists. If you're familiar with Python, and I assume you are because you're watching this video, that means that we actually can't really do headers.getName with a default value because this get is working against the list and then we'd have to destructure the tuple and so forth and so forth. So what we actually need to do is use a nice little Python trick, which is to convert our list of tuples to a dictionary like so. And this becomes all headers. So now we're in a position where we have an API. And if you've seen the other SDK videos, we should be familiar with this now where we can use a formatted interpolated string or an F string in Python, where we say hello. And here we'll do all headers and we'll just fetch out the name property. And I'll call this X name, just because we're using an HTTP header and custom headers usually start with an X dash. Now the case isn't important. It will always be lower cased when made available to you within the SDKs. But now that we've used our trick of converting our list of tuples to a dictionary, we've formatted our string, we can pop over to the terminal, do a spin build and a spin up, where we can now provide our X name header and curl our local endpoint, like so. And of course, just to show that this is real, although I know you all trust me by now, we can pass in the value that we want and it will be formatted as part of the response. So two things to take away here. Yes, it's crappy. We don't have LSP, but trust me, it's coming soon and it's going to be amazing. Two, use the Rust code. Again, you don't need to be able to write Rust. Find the struct, get enough information on the properties and the code will almost write itself. Sweet. Next up, HTTP request body. This one, super simple. You do body equals request.body and we'll print this to the CLI. But while we're here, let's change our from JSON import stump to also pull in the loads function. From here, we can say that our object equals loads and this will parse the string of the HTTP body as a JSON string. Meaning we can now do print and say if string name is object name, like so. So let's go back to our CLI where we can build and up. Now we can do a curl to localhost 3000, only this time we'll provide a JSON body where we'll set the name like so. Now we're still getting the standard JSON response that we set earlier, which just has hello world if X name is not defined. But as you'll see on the terminal output above, the standard print of the body returns the bytes with the JSON string, followed by the name as raw code after we've loaded the JSON and consumed one of the properties. Sweet. Okay, let's do the query string. And to make our lives a little bit easier, we're going to hard code our response and remove everything that we've done so far. Now, much like the body, the query string is available as a single property, but it's going to need pars from that property. We can grab the entire URI by asking for request URI. Now, if we print this now, what we'll see is we get a full string with the protocol, the host, 
the port if it exists, the path, and then anything beyond the path, such as the query string or fragments. But Python provides some standard library components that allow us to parse all this. So we can see from URL lib dot parse and port URL parse, as well as parse QS for query string. This means that we can say the query string equals to URL parse on the URI. And we want the query component. Copilot is always one step ahead. Next, we're going to want to get the query string as a dictionary. And for this, we'll just call this params, which is going to be equal to parse the query string from above. So let's do a pretty print of this to our terminal. So as always, we do a spin build and a spin up where we can now curl localhost 3000 and pass some parameters. And here we'll just say that name equals and ABC equals some values. You will have to code this to stop your terminal pulling out that ampersand, like so. We get the hard coded response back, which is fine, but in our CLI output, we can see the query string and the parsed keys and values. Now you can do whatever you need with the query string. Ta-da! Now finally, we're going to make an outbound HTTP request. Let's pop open our simple generated app.py and we'll add request to the spin HTTP as well as HTTP underscore send. These function names are the same as other SDKs. And if you need to dig into it, remember you can always check out the Rust source code for the SDK that you want to interact with. Now down here, we can say response equals HTTP send, where the send takes a request. Now the structure of a request requires the method, the URL, parameters, and throw on a none for good measure. Now, of course, good measure is not always a good reason to add arbitrary values to function calls. So remember, check out the code. An HTTP request takes a method, a URI, headers, and a body. As we can see from here and from here, the body is an option type. So providing none just means we want no body. I'm not going to parse the HTTP response from this request. Instead, let's just pretty print it and pull in the pretty print function, like so. Now we could jump back to our terminal. Aha, uh -huh, exactly. And type in your curl. Awesome. If you've seen any of the SDK videos before, you'll know that 100% we always expect destination not allowed. Why? Right in spin components, you have to very explicitly allow outbound request to the host that you want to speak to. As such, we need to add something to our spin.toml. In your component, you can say allowed HTTP host equals google.com. We can jump back spin up and build like so. Now we've made our HTTP response to google.com. However, you'll notice that we have a response object with a funny value inside of our terminal. So what do we do? We jump back to the Rust source code. We can see that our HTTP response has a status, headers, and a body. So let's modify our code for the status, the body, and the headers. We'll spin build up and curl. Now we can see lots of bytes for the body and our status code somewhere at the top, somewhere at the top, 200. With our headers being at the very bottom that we've, we got them here, don't you worry. So that is the spin SDK for Python. So Python is your jam. Start writing WebAssembly components using Fermion Spin today. The developer experience with the language server protocol, type-ins, and easier documentation is all coming very soon. Remember to check the description, updates will be coming soon. Of course, feel free to just go check out the repository available at github.com slash fermion slash spin dash python dash sdk. Watch it, follow for new releases, fermion ship fast, and changes will be coming very, very soon. That's the last time I'm going to say soon in this video. I'll see you soon.